Uh, well, before we go, I'm just going to do some quick fire questions. So, uh, what was the first fish you caught? Oof. I think it was probably a stillwater trout. We used okay. to, when we were really young, we used to go to a, a trout fishery called D Donington Trout Farm. And um, it was only five minutes away or less than that um, from where we lived. And we used to go there and we used to catch trout off sweet corn because we were so young. Yeah. You, you know, it's quite difficult to uh, keep kids interested, especially if you're fly fishing, because it is quite difficult when you when you start learning. Um, so yeah, we were fishing with sweet corn and we would catch a trout and then the guy would take the trout into his um, little fishery type shop. Um, but it was also where he had all the tanks of the fish. And so they were homegrown trout and he would get them on the sideboard and he would cut them open. And it was, it was literally from the lake and he would take them straight away up to the sideboard, cut them open and then take out the heart and show us that it was still pumping. Oh, right. And I just okay. remember that so vividly. And we were <sighs> so interested. Cause, yeah, because as a kid, you're so, you're, you're so interested in everything. You're curious and you want to ask as many questions as possible. And we, it was such a cool thing to see. And that's just, yeah. Um, but it was probably a trout. And other than that, um, when I was 11, I caught my first Atlantic salmon. And then the guy asked me whether I wanted to release it because normally you kill your first salmon, whether you want to catch and release after that. But actually I said to him, no, I want to let it go. So aged 11, just caught my first salmon, let it go. 10 minutes later, caught my second one. And I, I, like most of, most of the listeners will know that Atlantic salmon are really hard to catch. So it's, it's a really special moment when you do have one on the end of the line. And um, yeah, so that was, that I've was still, a very still cool not caught one. It's my, on my to-do list this year. I keep talking to, I think, you know, James Stokes, don't you? Or yes. You know, I keep kind of uh, chatting him up to try and uh, get on the tweed at some point because I think that's got quite good numbers if you want to catch one that's a the tine the tine sorry the tine that's um, a pretty good place to um to start so I'm, I'm considering trying to get up there this year and and then you can film the release yeah well that's uh that had crossed my mind as well so try not to treat it as work but you can't you can't yeah. <laughs> slightly off topic I wondered as well um why is it that we you never see bait fisheries for trout is it just because they'd be so suicidally easy to catch on on bait that it wouldn't be worth doing because you you next to never see any fisheries that are set up to allow you to bait fish for them do you i don't know is, is it just because they'd be really easy or so uh yeah I, I mean it probably would be easy like to be honest it's interesting that you said that because i'm just about to stock a lake um at the fishing school okay. so um and I've decided to go mix because I want kids to have the opportunity to course fish and fly fish. So I'm going to allow course fishing for kids on the lake, um, as well as stocking it with some course fish as well. Okay. And I think that that's just wonderful that you can course fish and fly fish on the same lake. There's no barriers. There's no, you know, it's all everyone can come and have a go and it, even if I have some people say oh can I come course fishing on your lake? Of course I'm going to let them go. I don't know why there's such a divide and I don't know. I really don't know why, because I mean, maybe, yes, it's probably easier to catch trout on, on, you know, sweet corn or uh, something smelling, you know, something yeah. that smells worm nice. I mean, if you, if you trot a river that's yeah. got trout and you're fishing a worm or a maggot, yeah. they're on it, you know, straight away. They're very, yeah. they're quite obliging. But I think, um, I think it goes back to fish welfare. As long as you get that fish in as quickly as possible and as long as you handle it the right way, and if it is catch and release, get it back as quickly as possible, keep it in the water and um, don't have it on the bank flapping about because this is how, you know, you might say, and there's a tagline that goes, goes along with this, um, uh, she went back fine. Um, she was out for a minute and she went back fine. And it, if you take a fish out of the water, it the recovery time is so much longer so yes it might kick and it might swim away but if you haven't handled that fish properly then the likelihood of that fish uh popping up and you know i don't know it could be half an hour later it could be a few minutes later popping up somewhere that you won't be able to see it um or maybe in a short distance um it, it, the likelihood of that is very high so 
for anyone who's just about to start fishing who or who's interested or maybe for people who perhaps can improve their catch and release handling and everyone can everyone can improve just make sure that you know the reason why we get to fish is because there are fish to catch so especially with wild fish you know put and take lakes you can get away with because these fish are farmed heavily so if you've got a kid that mishandles a fish and it goes back and it does die it's not the end of the world but if a wild fish something really precious uh, is mishandled and then you put it back and you think yeah yeah it just swam off really fine and you've had it on the bank for ages and it, I'm not saying every species is like this because I know that the carp world you know that's slightly different where you can yeah. have the carp out but at the same time I heard someone say that the the bigger carp if you get them out onto land um for too long or even the biggest one the very big ones out onto land at all it's it squishes their organs so i think we've got to be really mindful of how we treat these fish when they come out because personally for me i will 99 percent try and get into the water with the fish because yeah. i don't have to bring it up on an unnatural surface where it's going to remove its um you know protective slime or it's going to hit its head you know just and a lot of people say oh yeah but the salmon you know if you've got an atlantic salmon up on the the ground and they say yeah yeah but they they jump on oh i can still still hear Sorry, you yeah. someone, That's okay. someone told me um but uh yeah it's fine because salmon jump jump up up uh, waterfalls and hit themselves on rocks yeah okay that's fine but that's a natural state that they go through they don't want to be brought out and lay on the grass or stones pebbles so get in the water don't be lazy we've all got legs you know we can walk and get into the water so um yeah just caring for the fish is my number one thing and i hate i hate it when i see mishandling it really grinds my gears because it's really easy to look after these fish if we're catching and releasing it's clear to see you're quite passionate about that so that's which is a good thing obviously um have you got a favorite fish atlantic salmon <laughs> should have shouldn't shouldn't have really need to ask that should i <laughs> king of the river yeah why why <laughs> what is it about them why why the atlantic salmon I think because I've been chasing them since I was so young, since I was eight years old. So, and it's something that my mother is, you know, my mother is so obsessed with Atlantic salmon. So I kind of, I think it's just ingrained in me from such a young age. And I think that because of, you know, the state of the, the stocks and how they're depleting so fast, I think for me, I'm, I'm even more so passionate about the species and, and trying to, you know, conserve them as much as possible and I think they're just incredible I mean their migratory route is out to Greenland and and what they have to go through to then come back to the their birth river is just incredible it's you can't even imagine what what they've seen and what they've you know how many die from I mean at the moment they're saying that um, at least 50 percent of smolts which is a young salmon which goes from the river out to sea to feed um that the 50 percent of the smolts aren't even making it out to the estuaries so the problem is in the rivers which is yeah. which is crazy because before all the tagging um happened they thought that the problem was out at sea so they were, weren't expecting that and um yeah it's just a very sad situation salmon yeah they definitely had a hard uh hard few years and I guess they're unusual and that they're one of the few fish that most people if you said to someone tell me the life cycle of a salmon even if they're not an angler or into wildlife they, they'd have some idea oh they they're in the river they go yeah. out to sea whereas you know if you said uh, tell me about a barbel they'd be like what's a barbel so it's quite nice that salmon have got that wider wider reach uh, have you got a favorite venue Oof. Mm not i mean to be honest my salmon fishing is very sporadic i mean i guide on my home river the river yore uh, which is a recovering salmon river but other than that i would say scotland but i haven't really been able to go up there much over the last year or two so um but if i'm if i'm if you're if you say to me okay you can be anywhere right now where would you be and that would probably be um in the tropical salt water Oh, okay, well, like bonefish yeah. and tarpon and stuff. Yeah, bonefish, tarpon, permit, 
um, any reef fish. Yeah. So get me to the salt. That's where I'm, where I am now in my dreams. I did Cuba last year in January. Oh. Um, but it wasn't, it wasn't where all the flats are. So, because I, I, in my head, I was like, oh, Cuba's an island. It can't be that big. And I was like a 10 hour drive from where they, they do all the, oh. all the fly fishing. And I was like, oh, so that was a little bit annoying. So I ended up just kind of catching little tiddlers off a pier. But it was still oh, nice. But, that's um, good though. I'll get, uh, I'll get out there at some point do do a little bit of that. Uh, I suspect I know the answer to this, but favourite method? Um, fly fishing. I mean, fly fishing is something that I've really focused on um, for so many years now. And I love it, you know, and um, it's something that keeps me alive like I love I love I love it um I love it all and even in the toughest of times you know in situations where I've just done 20 days on pike in the on the Baltic coast which was so cold wading not even on a boat wading <laughs> and it was so cold and by the end of you know 20 days I just said I just want to enjoy my life again I just I just I just want to go home and that was enough for me so um you know even in the toughest t time but when everything comes together and when you catch a fish in really horrendous um conditions you know that is something that is so rewarding that you can't even explain to others until they give it a go i guess the nice thing with fly fishing as well is it is well it depend, depends on how physically fit you are but there is a an element of exercise to it like obviously you can carp fish and you can go to sleep and leave your rods but with fly fishing you're 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 moving around you're constantly casting like it is it's uh, you say to people fishing is good exercise and they're like oh you just sit down all day but fly fishing books the trend for that like you can keep relatively fit by fly fishing yeah i mean i guess a lot of the time fly fishing you're moving because you're trying to cover as many fish as possible whereas with let's say carp or sometimes coarse fishing you're sitting there and waiting for those fish to come into your swim so it's very very different and i think that both aspects is are great because some people just want to chill and sit there and enjoy the nature around them whereas some people fly fishing suits them better because they want to be more active they want to walk around they want to you know explore rivers for miles and miles every day so it's really really cool that we have so many different types of um, techniques methods and things that suit any anyone i guess that's make because it's so accessible that's probably one of the reasons why it's such a a large uh, participated sport really because more or less anyone can uh, can do it um and i'll end on this last one so have you have you got an angling hero growing up was there anyone who like they are someone you kind of learned a lot from or, or respected a lot funny you say that because you've just interviewed him <laughs> jeremy oh. wade was my pinup i mean <laughs> i have many heroes but he was for so long growing up was my pinup and every time someone would mention his name i'd be like oh, i love jeremy wade <laughs> and um it's very embarrassing now because actually he came to uh do a talk at the your salmon group fishy dinner um so and everyone knew that he was my pinup when i was younger and everyone wanted to talk to him, I'm like, too shy. So anyway, I just went into complete meltdown, but it was really cool meeting him. And he's a really interesting guy. I think he's explored the world and, and you know, done so many things that everyone would dream about. And at, at, at the same time, he sort of brings that home for everyone to watch and um, love his investigating type, um, you know, programs. And I do, yeah. And uh, there's just so many great people out there that have done so much for the sport and so many heroes that we all look up to. And uh, we're really lucky to have these people that have paved the way and um, and offer so much to the sport. Yeah, he, he's an absolute legend. He's a lovely chap as well. He's kind of very, very down to earth. And um, yeah, he's a great, he's a great guy. Well, well, look, it's been it's been great chatting to you, uh, Marina, and finding out a little bit more about. How you do it and some of the perceptions in in angling so thanks for thanks for coming on thank you so much and uh again like i just want to thank you and i want to um sort of uh, tell you that i i've also enjoyed your work and i think that it's really inspiring i remember um 
I don't I don't think I met you because you had so many people around you at the London Fly Fishing Fair a few years ago but I remember um looking you up and just seeing all your photos and um I think that was the year that your book came out I think possibly but yeah, anyway I just I think that it's a really cool thing for anyone to try and actually study these fish underwater because most of us uh don't get the chance and just and don't really know what's happening underneath the water and I that's why it's, it's something that really uh, intrigues me and I think that you do such an amazing job the quality of your photos the the adventure that you um that you take yourself on and show us is great that's very kind of you I mean I will definitely take you up on the we'll have to do the chalk stream uh day at some point like get in and have yes. a little snorkel that would be good like see how things that go this year so exciting and I can't wait for you to come so I will I will sort that out next year it was something because they've got really big pike in there and they've got undercut banks and uh, you normally catch them right there so when I was swimming down I was just looking right to left thinking oh god I'm so scared it was so, it, you know the ribbon weed and every it was really spooky especially when you're by yourself it can be yeah. really spooky oh it's great it's really it's great the incredible. adrenaline yeah it's fantastic. yeah it's good. Oh, we'll we'll definitely it. do that, Marie. That sounds good. Well, look, take care. Okay, thanks so much. Bye.